Good morning, church. It's always a privilege to stand before you. I don't take it for granted. I'm deeply humbled. I'm deeply honored. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, a very good morning to you all. Um, My prayer is that the word of God will bless all of us. And we will go away from here knowing that we have indeed um, touched the one who brought us here. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just appreciate you this morning as we come before you. We humble our hearts, O Lord, to receive your word. I decrease, Lord, for you to increase in in our midst this morning. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Minister to us even much more than we are hearing. Let your word enter our hearts, become fertile, and bear fruits to the glory of your name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, 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 amen. Amen. Uh, Before I start, as always, I just want to appreciate my husband. He's he's a very supportive and loving and kind man, and I just thank God for his life. He's here with me this morning. Uh, It's not hard to know who he is. We're we're both in blue, so, (laughs) you know. Thank you for always being there for me. Thank you. God bless you. Right. Um, our, past, I mean, our, our topic for this morning um, is called Getting God's Attention. How to get God's attention. And our text is taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, from 11 to 18. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, from 11 to 18, and I'll read. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Verse 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then... I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I covenanted with David your father saying, you shall never fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. May the Lord bless his word. Amen. 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 Before we delve into the passage proper, let's first of all look at the context of this passage and how to apply it in our present time. So the context of this passage is found in, it's found right after Solomon, David's son, um, the king, has built and dedicated this huge, massive temple to the Lord. We see this in Chronicles chapter 6 and also chapter 7, verse 1 to 10. Um, Because of the length of the passage and our time, uh, we will not read that, but I'll encourage you to read the background to that um, in your own time. In 2 Chronicles 7, 11 to 22, as we just read, God appears to Solomon and tells him that he has heard his prayer. And part of God's response is what we read in verse 14. And verse 14, for your information, is a key text for today. If the people pray, then God will respond and bring blessings back to the land. In 2 Chronicles 6, from 22 to 40, Solomon had talked about what 
happens when the people sin and then turn in prayer and asking God to hear them and to forgive them. It's a whole low, long passage. When they sin and you've withheld this, when they sin and you've caused this to happen, when they sin and that has happened, if they come back to you in prayer, please forgive them. Therefore, the statement, you know, I mean, first of all, let's keep in mind that that covenant is part of the one that God made through the ministry of Moses to the people of Israel, that if they keep God's law, then they will stay in the land and have prosperity. But if they break God's law, then God will send drought and difficulties, and eventually he will send them into exile. Again, read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. They're very hard to read, but, you know, it's good to read them because it tells, it gives us a background to um, what we're going to hear this morning. So therefore, the statement is intimately tied to the covenant between God and Israel and connected to the temple and that particular time, okay? So the question then is, what does this mean for us today? Well, one thing we need to keep in mind is that the, in the Old Testament, God made a covenant with a particular nation, Israel, okay? The covenant focused on their status and life in the land, okay? If they obey, they will be in the land and prosper. But if they disobey, they will be kicked out, okay? So the new covenant that we see now made through Jesus is not about a nation, but about people who have faith in God, okay? The goal of the New Testament is not about wealth and prosperity. Rather, it's about the mission of bringing God's message to the world and for us to live as God intended for us to live, yeah? So when I read 2 Chronicles 7, 14, um, my mind turns to the church. When God's people, those called by his name, and we're going to go into that, you know, what does it mean to be God's people and called by his name? When they find themselves in sin and they are experiencing the consequences of that sin, and they humble themselves and pray, now in the name of Jesus Christ, obviously, he brings healing and forgiveness. Again, I'm going to be giving you some verses. If you write them down, go and read them. Because of the length of some of the scriptures, we may not be able to um, read them this morning. Hebrews 12, 3 to 11. So this healing that God is promising now is less about prosperity in terms of material blessings, but more about healing in terms of spiritual effectiveness and the ministry that God has called us into. Amen? Amen. So the message for us here is that God will respond to our cries. And how has he responded in our present time? By sending Jesus Christ, who does what Solomon could never do. That is, obey God completely, okay? The truth then is that if God's people, that is, his church, humble themselves and seek his face, they will bring blessings to the world, okay? We are God's representative here on earth. So if we humble ourselves and pray and seek his, you know, obey his commands and pray for, you know, we, we stand as intermediaries, if you like, then God brings blessings to the world. The only, the only hope for healing a land is found when people turn to God, looking unto Jesus, who is said to be the author and the perfecter of our faith. So the hope of the world is not in policies and man-made um, systems. We see how that is failing every time. We bring one law, it fails. I bring another law, it fails. The hope of the world is found in the church. As the church lives in the command of God to love God and love others as well as fulfilling its mission to teach the way of Christ, then we see healing in the land. Then we see blessings in the land. Now, having understood the context of that verse, let's now look at the conditions and God's promises if we comply. Okay? So there is Would a if like and there is a then. So the first one is not necessarily a condition, but it's a statement of fact. So it says, if my people who are called by my name. Now, this one may seem obvious, you know, and it is. But if you are thinking from a national perspective, then it may be easy to misapply this verse, okay? In Old Testament times, um, the verse applied to the children of Israel, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, the nation of Israel or the Jewish people. Let's note that not everyone who lived in Israel was a Jew, just as in this day and time, not everyone living in every nation is a Christian, okay? So, however, this notion, this notion, my people, 
also applies to Christians, okay? Since we are Gentiles and we were grafted into this good vine through Jesus Christ, okay? Again, read the full context of that in Romans 11. So the, goal, the call goes out to those who are ease in a nation, okay? So he says, if my people who are called by my name, that is God's people, and who are God's people? That's you and I, okay? The if, that if is a two-letter word, but it's, pa- it's obviously the most important word in this passage because it serves as a qualifier, okay? The word if is conditional. So if what? If my people, not the nation, not the country, my people. This means it doesn't require an entire nation humbling itself to, for change to take place. Only the people of God. Can, we can bring change. We can bring change to this society. We can bring change to Croydon. We can bring change to the United Kingdom. We can bring change even from here to our own, you know, uh, motherland back home. Of course, the more committed believers are to the kingdom, the more we are committed to the commission that Jesus gave us to go out there and make disciples of all men, of all nations, then the more a nation will be filled with, the, with disciples, okay? Today, God's people are those who have been saved from their sins by faith in God through Jesus Christ, his son, okay? Number two says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. That's a very big word. It's only one, two, three, four, five, five six letters, but it's big, okay? Humility is the most important requirement of this verse 14, 2 Chronic, Chronicles 7, 14. Humble themselves is a, is a statement of position. When we humble ourselves, we bend low, we prostrate, we fall to the ground, we meet God on our knees. In my culture, I mean, not everybody in Nigeria does this, but in the Yoruba culture, when we meet someone who is older than us, we kneel down, we prostrate. We bow. It's a sign of humility, sign of respect. We're honoring you and all that. And that's what God is calling us into here as well. Humility. Now, a humble person not only sees himself as they are, lowly and desperate, but they also see God as he is. Majestic, sovereign, omnipotent, powerful, gracious, loving, kind. We see God, who himself also humbled himself, and went to the cross for us. I mean, imagine Christ giving up all that, the creator of the world, coming into the world he created, to the people he created, for us to slap him, you know, spit at him, stamp on him, and eventually nail him to the cross. And yet on that cross, what did he say? With his arms wide open, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. God responds to humble repentance of those who acknowledge him, even if they are not his people. Let's look at the story of um, Nineveh, for instance, when God sent Jonah to go and, you know, talk to them, preach to them. Despite his initial reluctance and, you know, the outcome of that, he went. And what did the people of Nineveh do? They humbled themselves. They, 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 they wore sackcloth, they repented, and God relented from being, bringing judgment upon them. So the church is responsible for the state of the nation. Why do I say that? Because the state of a nation is simply a magnified view of the state of the church. And that is why God is saying, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, the condition laid out here, is to his people who are called by his name. A nation's transformation begins with the church. So if the church can begin to look outward, before it begins to look outward, it must first look inward. Are we truly God's people? Are we serving God the right way? Are we models of Christian living? Are we truly following the scriptures? Are we truly following Jesus Christ? 
It's not about, you know, coming inside a building, my brothers and sisters. It's about being followers of Christ. Amen. You remember the passage where some were saying to him, oh, uh, we did this in your name, we did that in your name, and he said, get away from me. He didn't say, I don't know you. He said, I never knew you. I never knew you. That is, God forbid, may our, I mean, it's scary, yes, brother. You know, after all of this, after coming in every Sunday, after doing this and cleaning this and doing that, and, God, and Jesus says, I never knew you. Number three, he says, and pray. Pray. It didn't, the, 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 the verse didn't quite elaborate on pray, but I think it's simple enough for us. It simply means that God's people must pray. Okay? As Christians, we have no higher calling than prayer. We're only as strong or as weak as our prayer life. Entering God's presence is the only way to find grace and strength for change. It's hard to get right with God if you aren't spending time with him. I don't know how some people live their Christian lives without prayer. There is no, I mean, some people will say prayer, I wouldn't even say some people, even I will say prayer is a two-way communication with God. Now, if you say you love someone and you've given your life to them and you, you know, you want to honor them, you want to obey them with your life, and then you never talk to them. I mean, it's like cutting someone. I mean, we've all, for those of us who are married, we've been at that stage. It cools down after a while, so don't get me wrong. But um, initially, you're on the phone 24-7. You are texting, you are phoning, you are visiting. I remember then it wasn't a time of... Um, texting and phone and all that. I was still doing, I was still in uni. And my husband would travel from uh, London to come and see me in uh, Essex. You know, patiently waiting there. Even if I was in class, he would sit down like a gentleman. You know, he was always there. He was, you know, he doesn't see the traveling. I mean, we're talking of a couple of hundred miles. Ma- he, he didn't see it as any issue. Even when I finished, he bought a van to help me carry all my things to London. He was always there. You know, when I visit him, he was cooking for me. He's, you know, and I'm like. <laughs> He's like, what would you eat? What would you, you know, like I said, it calms down. But, um, you know, the, the foundation is still there. And it's the same with prayer. You know, um, I think what we get, tend to do is that we tend to get familiar. Like, I got familiar with my husband, expecting all these things. I re- forgetting that, hey, ho, you are supposed to be the help. So not the other way around. <laughs> so get, your, get, get off your seat and go and do some cooking. You know. And, you know, we, 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 we cool off. We come, we talk, 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 pray, 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 pray. We don't even wait to hear whether he's going to respond or what he's going to say and how we're going to take that forward. I've unloaded and that is it. Do whatever you want with what I've said. Now, for prayer to be effective and to bring much needed, the, the much-needed revival we're crying out for, in addition to humbling ourselves, we should pray in faith. Okay? Um, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we should believe that our prayer time with him, the time we spent with him, is not in vain. He will receive our request and he will answer our prayers. We should also be specific in our requests. Many of us just talk and talk and talk. We're not specific. Lord, bless you. Bless you with what? Eh? You know, I remember the story I read somewhere that this person was, you know, wanted to, he kept saying, oh, uh, Lord, I want to win the lottery. I want to win the lottery. I want to win the lottery. He got so much on God's nerves, and then one day the Holy Spirit said, okay, you want to win the lottery. Go and play it first. You've not even bought the tickets. You've not played the thing. You've not entered the... So, you know, how am I going to... How are you going to win the millions? It doesn't happen like that. So let's be specific in our request. And make sure that even in being specific, we have already done the needful, okay? There's no point you being 
you know, lazing, lazing around with work in the office, and yet you want promotion. And God is saying, no, you are not, you know, you are not glorifying me in that work. Okay, you may want promotion, but I ain't going to give it to you. You come late to the office, you, you know, you, you, know you, you don't do your work properly, everything is shoddy, and yet you want me to promote you. How do I justify that? Huh? So let's be specific in our, pray, in our request. Let's agree with others when we pray as a group. You know, it's good to pray as a group. You know, uh, uh, the Bible talks about one will put to flight a hundred, but two people will put to flight 10,000. I mean, that's an equation that, I mean, I don't know if there are mathematicians here. It's an impossible one to, in our own understanding. One, 100. Two, 10,000. I mean, you know. So let's agree as a group. Let's harmonize with those who are in our group, whether we are in cell or we are in, uh, you know, online prayer or during our praying and fasting and all that, that we are united. It's not like one person's heart is somewhere, this is what somebody wants, and somebody is saying, let's pray about this, but they're, they're saying, I, I really don't understand. Why should we pray about that one? You know, I know more. You know, so let's come into prayer with open heart, with the readiness to, you know, agree with one another then let's give God a reason. You know, what I'm praying for, what I'm asking for, how does it bring glory to God? How does it honor the work of God? How does it lift up the house of God? How does it bring more into God's king, many more people into God's kingdom? Let's remind God of his promises. There's so many, the Bible is littered with promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will uphold you, I will strengthen you. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. You know, call on me and I will answer you. And so many, many um, promises in there. Let's, let's hold God to that. Number four, it says, and seek my face. The fourth condition is that his people, and let me continue to put that emphasis on, if my people, God's people, okay, um, Seek his face. We must seek God's face. In Jeremiah 29, 13, the prophet Jeremiah says that if we seek God earnestly, we will find him. Okay? I mean, seeking God's face refers to diligently searching to know God and seek his favor. Okay? Um, uh, uh, please bear with me. Yeah. Seek his favor. I'm trying to um, get a, a scripture here that I've looked at. And, um, you know, the best way to seek to know God is by studying his word, um, the Bible. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, um, 15 says, um, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Another version says, study to show yourself approved. A workman worthy of his wages, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if, you, if we don't know what the word of God says, how are we going to apply it? Okay? So when we seek God's face, we're really seeking his word and to apply it in our lives. The best way to seek God's favor is by believing his word and humbly trusting him. If we read his word and we don't believe it, or we don't practice it, like James says, we'll be like the person who looks at his face in the mirror, turns away, and forget what he looks, what he looks like. So let's not make Bible reading just a chore. Let's make it, let's go, go to it with the desire, the, 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 the intention to seek God's face, to seek to know God's word, and to trust God even as we read it. Now, notice it does not say, seek my hand, okay? Too often, we seek God's hand, what he can do for us, what he can give to us, more than we seek his face. Now, in as much as God wants to give us everything we want, or, well, not want, everything we need, um, I think he still wants, to, wants us to love him for who he is. Okay, if God loved us because 
we're pretty or we're tall, we're dark, we're handsome, then what happens to those who are not pretty and tall and dark and handsome? But God says God's love is, you know, meted out to all. He loves us so much that he gave his only son to die for us. So if we want to get right with God, don't just seek God for what God can do for you. Seek God for who he is. Sit in his presence. Take time to honor him. Take time to get to know him. Sometimes sitting in God's presence does not even mean that we're talking, 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 talking. No, sometimes you just sit there and just listen and just worship him in your spirit. You know, the Bible says those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Just let him minister to you. Read the Bible and sit there. What does this mean, God? What are you telling me? You know, I mean, there's no way that we do that, that we won't get God's attention. You know, um, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, all these things we are running after, all these things we are hankering for, all these positions we're seeking. It says the Lord will add it unto us. Number five, turn from, says, if my people, sorry, I've lost that again, turn from their wicked ways. Turn from their wicked ways. The fifth condition is that we must turn from our wicked ways. This requirement is straightforward. People must repent of their sin and change their behavior. That is the long and short of it. In the physical sense, turning involves a change in direction. Okay? Turning from one thing automatically results into turning into something else. To successfully change a habit or a behavior or a lifestyle, you must replace it. <clears throat> Trying to stop something without replacing it will leave a vacuum. And if you don't replace it, you are likely to return to it. The theological word for turning from our wicked, sinful, unholy lifestyle and walking towards God is called repentance. I didn't go to school of theology, so pastor, please tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, repentance means to turn around, basically. It is to say, I'm going in the wrong direction. I need to turn from my wicked way. I need to turn from this habit. I need to stop this thing I'm doing. I need to stop lying. I need to stop stealing. I need to stop pretending. I need to stop gossiping. I need to stop you know, making up stories. Repentance does not mean feeling sorry or, you know, uh, crying over something or blaming someone else for, for what is wrong in your life. It's a spiritual about face. You know, on our road, sometimes you see some signs, no U-turn. But with repentance, you are U-turning all the time. It is a permanent U-turn, Okay. It means to change your mind, to think differently, to turn your heart away from sin and toward God. Now, repentance is an act of the will, okay? You have to want to repent. Getting right with God is your responsibility. It is not your pastor's responsibility. It is not your deacon's responsibility. It is not your parents' responsibility. It's not your spouse's responsibility. It's not even your Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It is your responsibility. You have to want to repent. You have to want to change. You have to get to a place that you say, I've had enough of this thing in my life. It's not getting me anywhere. I've pretended too long. If it is food, I've eaten too much. All my clothes are so tight, now I have to stop. You know, if it is sleep, you have to find a way to stop, to, to sleep less. You know, there must be, you know, there must be a genuine desire to change. Repentance always brings change. If you repent of something and it's not visible in your life, then, you know, I, I would, I'll, be a bit, uh, I'll be a bit worried. Repentance is obvious. People will see you and know, uh -uh, there's something changed about this person. Now, having studied the three, I mean, the five conditions, now let's look at the three conditional promises that God gave 
that he would do in repentance to people meeting these conditions. The first one, he says, then I will hear from heaven. The word then is used in conjunction with the word if, okay? And if we have achieved the if, then heaven will move and God will accomplish the then, okay? Also, the word hear says, I will hear from heaven. It doesn't refer to the physical sense of hearing. It means to listen, pay attention, and give heed to what someone is saying. You can hear all the noise of the car going. Does that mean you are going to get out from this room and go out there and see what the car is? No. The hearing that God is saying he will hear here is that he will pay attention. He will listen. And he will give heed to what you are saying. Psalm 66, 18 to 19 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Now, God will not accept our prayers if we accept sin in our lives. So the first promise is that if, again, you know, the two-letter word, if. If God's people will, humble, hum, will humbly confess and turn from their sins and seek to please him, then God will pay attention and give heed to their prayers. So if we want to claim God's promise to Solomon, we must confess and forsake any sin in our life that we are aware of. If we do, then God will listen. You may think I'm hammering on about sin. If you go and read 2 Chronicles chapter 6, you will see that all of God's, I mean, all of Solomon's prayer and talk with God was when the people sin and do this, when the people sin and do this, when the people sin and do this, and if they come to you and confess and pray, please forgive them. And that is the crux of the matter. Listen, if there was no sin, Jesus needed needn't have come. If we were perfectly perfect, if Genesis 3 didn't happen, we'd still be living in the dispensation of Genesis 2, where we were in this lovely garden. No problems. God fed us. He came in the evening. We had a chat. He went back up. How are you doing, Ayo? I'm fine, sir. How about you? Abba, I'm really good, sir. Everything is fantastic. What are you doing with the plants? I just watered them. You know, everything will be perfect. But chapter 3 happened. <laughs> chapter 3 happened. And here we are. Forget whether it is the woman that ate the snake and the snake ate the woman. Forget all of that. <laughs> chapter 3 happened. Because, you know, we have people who are like, hey, it's the woman. You are the one who caused all this problem. Eh, but we're still the one making everything good. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Let's forget the... The, the sex of who did what. Chapter 3 happened, and we're here. But God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, he knew before chapter 2 happened that chapter 3 will happen. And long before chapter 3 happened, God had already made a way to help us to get through chapter 3. And that's why you and I are here today. But we cannot be careless about how we are doing the will of God in our lives. With God, is all or nothing. Honestly, you can't be one leg in and one leg out. You can't get, get, God, you can't get God's attention with any shoddy Christian practice. And maybe that is why the church is not as effective in society today as we want it to be. Because if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, pray. Are we doing that? Number two, he said, forgive sin. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. Sin is any disobedience to God's prevailed, I mean, revealed will. God has revealed his will to us through Christ Jesus. Now, he didn't make Christ sit in heaven and be demonstrating how we are to live. He did that through Moses initially with all these laws. 
But the more the law, the more the sin. Because honestly, it's, I mean, how many of the Mosaic laws could they even have remembered then? Uh, myself and Hobby were reading through a passage two days ago, just, you know, talking about, you know, if somebody oxen did this, don't do that. If somebody did this, if somebody stood there, do, and it was like, we came to the conclusion that we, we could thank God for Jesus. <laughs> thank God for Jesus. How many are we going to even remember? But God said, okay, let me send my son. And Jesus came. He didn't just speak. He lived the life. So it's not so much about what we say. It's not even so much about what I am saying on it. Am I living the life? Can my husband come before you now and say, the way she's preaching is the way she is at home. Please don't say anything. No. <laughs> you know, thankfully for us Christians, we've been freed from the ceremonial requirements of the Old Testament law. I mean, this law was specifically for the children of Israel at the time. However, God still expects us to obey the moral aspects of the law, okay? The word forgive means to pardon, to exonerate, to excuse, to release. It refers to, you know, removing the guilt of sin and releasing the forgiven one from the penalty of their wrongdoing, okay? So God takes no pleasure in, you know, punishing the wicked. Instead, God's desire is that all should repent and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Psalm, I mean, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What God wants is a repentant heart. He wants to forgive sin, but first we must humbly confess our sin and turn from it. Turn from it. That is the key. Turn from it. We must turn from it. And he says to us in 1 John 1, 8 to 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. And what is it? Yes. And just. Well done, guys. You read your Bible. I, I, it, slipped, <laughs> it went off quick, so thank God. You know, if we, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of what? All unrighteousness. Is it one unrighteousness? It says all unrighteousness. And finally, in his promise, he says, and heal their land. Now, in the context of God's promise to Solomon, their land refers to the promised land um, of God's chosen people, Israel, at that time. Okay? So the word heal in this verse refers to um, God restoring his favor to the children of Israel by removing the consequences of their backsliding and returning peace and prosperity within the promised, their promised land at that time. So in effect, God is saying that when a people turn from their sin, he will remove the chastisement he has brought upon their land. Now, life application for us. More than likely, it's not your land that needs healing. Maybe you have a little bit of garden behind your house. That's not what needs healing. So the direction here is to pray for whatever you need to be healed in your life. It could be your marriage. It could be your finances. It could be your children. It could be your health. It could be your career. You know, it could be any personal need. Let's use that as the land that God will heal when we, when we fulfill all these promises. So even though 2 Chronicles 7.14 was for national healing of the land of Israel, we can use it as an example of what you need to do for God. I mean, what you need God to do for you in your personal situation. Right. Um, in conclusion, church buildings will not attract God. But fire in the heart of those holy people who worship in that building will, and witness in them is what will attract God. Christians who carry large Bibles will not attract God. But people who are right with God will attract him. Amen. So what steps, I challenge you this morning in close, what steps do you need to take to get right with God? When all the actions we've spoken about are carried out, 
then God says he would hear from heaven and heal our land. In other words, he would deliver national mercy on his people, and that is you and I. Thank you for listening. Before we go, I just want us to sing this song. Um, I've asked uh, my, my dear brother to come and because if I sing, you will all disperse. So, um, and my lovely sister as well. It's called, When I Look Into Your Holiness. Listen, um, God delights in the praises of his people. If, 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 if heavens could open to show you how God feels when we come before him, how God feels when we honor him with our life, you know, um, I, I, I look at Solomon and, you know, his prayer. Before that prayer, you know what Solomon had done? He had offered a huge sacrifice, 120,000 cattle, uh, 20,000 sheep and whatever, whatever it is. I mean, I can just physically see God looking down and say, this one I have to get up. And him getting up and coming. That is what our life should be. That will make God get up from his seat and say, let me go. Let me go and see what my daughter is doing, what my son is doing. Let me bless them. How are we honoring him? How are we honoring, honoring him in our homes? How are we honoring him at work? How are we honoring him even here? My sister has, I mean, where is she? She's not here. She stood here and talked so much about the various ministries. But some people will still get up and go and they still not join any ministry. Poor woman. She has to repeat it every day. It's because ministries are not being, you know, are not filling up. So, you know, Let's not just come into the house of God for what we can get from God. It's about what are we doing for God and his word to be ministered, to be spread, to be seen in and around us. Bless you. When I look into your holiness. Can we stand and sing that song together in praise and welcome? Thank you. to you afresh this morning, Father. We say, Lord, Lord, Father, 
Lord, come in your power, in your mercy, in your might, and change whatever needs to be changed. Uproot whatever needs to be uprooted. Transform whatever needs to be transformed, O Lord. Let your will be done in our lives, and let your name alone be glorified in Jesus' mighty name. When my people who are called by my name humble themselves and seek my face and pray, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. May the Lord bless us all. Amen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Lord, let it be so in this land, in this church, in our lives, in our children's lives, in the future of this nation and the nations that you've guided us from. In the name of Jesus. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and always. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give a clap offering to the Lord.